This podcast is brought to you by Knowledge at Wharton. For more information, please visit knowledge.wharton.upenn.edu. GE Commercial Aviation Services is the uh, commercial aviation financing and leasing uh, business of GE within GE Capital. Um, it was essentially put together uh, in 1993 or 4 through a merger of a small business GE had and GE's purchase uh, during a downturn of a company called Guinness Peat, which was the second largest aircraft leasing company. Um, we have approximately um, 350 people involved in our main business line and approximately 150 uh, who are involved in a, a spare parts business we have. Um, it's a, it produces, uh, I think, the largest uh, net income per employee of any business in GE. Uh, for the last two years, net income has been roughly $1.2 billion. That's net income uh, based on only, I guess it's 500 people or 350. Uh, and we're engaged in all facets of commercial uh, mainly aircraft, but also engine financing, and it can be equity, it can be debt, and so on. The industry has been impacted different ways, depending on whether you're an airline, uh, a uh, manufacturer, or a financier, such as we are. The airlines have been impacted, first and foremost, in the period running up to last July, July of 08, by the enormous and dramatic rise in fuel pricing. Uh, Pricing doubled in a period of a few months. Um, essentially, the entire industry uh, model of operation had to change because this was an industry which was a high fixed cost industry. And suddenly, fuel, which had been historically maybe 10, 12 percent, uh, rose to over 40 to 45 percent, which necessitated a complete change in strategy for the airlines. Um, now, uh, the airlines themselves have, ha have been benefited by the fact that fuel has dropped. And on the other hand, demand, passenger demand, which is the ultimate driver, is also dropping, and most particularly uh, premium traffic. That's uh, put a drain, obviously, on their cash balances and the like. Um, fundamentally, the cause, the cause of all this is an imbalance between passenger demand and the supply of aircraft because that dictates fares, it dictates load factors. And that specifically is the area that most of directly affects us, the supply of aircraft and the demand for aircraft in the form of passenger demand. And where uh, supply is exceeding demand, as you can imagine, values fall, lease rentals fall, et cetera. So um, for us, for the airlines and for the manufacturers who are now facing deferrals and cancellations uh, and the need to finance um, aircraft because financing is not generally available, it puts an enormous strain on the industry. GCAS um, has been through, uh, as a company, uh, one of the other most significant downturns, and that was the downturn precipitated by the uh, tragedy at the World Trade Center. Um, our strategy in, in every downturn is very similar, and that is uh, we focus very operationally on the um, execution of leases and the um, uh, management and oversight of the aircraft, technical oversight, and the like, making sure that our accounts receivable do not get out of control, uh, often being very proactive and taking aircraft out almost immediately when there's a default where others uh, usually will wait and see if there's, uh, there's some hope that an airline will survive. Um, and the other element which we've used successfully is that we'll use that time um, to finance because the industry is sort of countercyclical. Meaning, when the industry is going well, everyone wants metal. And that was true from the third quarter of 2004 through the end of 2007. One could not meet the industry demands for, for metal. So our metal, meaning our 1,500 aircraft, were in great demand. Everyone had access to capital, so they didn't need our financing. Since the first quarter of 2008, it's reversed. 
no one <laughs> is looking for a lot of metal, and, but everyone you, needs cash. And that's where we have generally moved so that we try to deal with the counter-cyclicality through the offering of various products, metal or money. Management across the globalization can be challenging. It's obviously been simplified because of the internet and access to electronic means of communication. Otherwise, um, it would be almost impossible because uh, the, this morning, a half an hour ago, I was on an email with our China team who was dealing with the default and they wanted my approval for something and if they had to send a letter in and whatever, it wouldn't work. But the biggest challenge, I think, is just making sure uh, that communication, first of all, is consistent uh, and clear throughout the organization. Uh, one can be very surprised at how messages can, can be garbled between Connecticut, where I'm headquartered, and our team in Stanford, uh, our team in Dubai, our team in Singapore, our team in Russia, our team in China. Uh, number two, I think it's very important, uh, and, and it's proven to be true, that we have to be mindful that the conditions that uh, our team uh, works under are not necessarily as easy as our conditions are here in the States. It's not to say that there isn't access to the Internet, but often the distances they have to travel. My leader in Singapore, uh, you know, when he has to travel, uh, from Singapore to Australia, New Zealand, up to Japan, we're talking about enormous travel time, which puts a burden on him personally and on his team. Um, those are the main things. But we have, we have um, for about eight years, had a very global mindset. We have been pushing more and more into the developing world. And the team has responded well because, like most uh, energized people, they want the opportunity to succeed. So as we've been allocating more aircraft to China, to Russia, to India, to Brazil, to Malaysia, okay, that team has responded because they see a growth of the business in their area. There is a significant difference both in the global markets and even domestically between uh, GCAS and uh, our competitors, including even uh, the, the, the really outstanding ones, um, in two respects, I would say. We are the most global in terms of our penetration of offices. We have more feet on the street, closer to the airlines than anyone. I'm not aware of anyone who has two salesmen in Russia. I'm not aware of anyone who has a team actually focused on Africa specifically. Uh, we have more people in China. Um, um, and people in Latin America who are there constantly. And our, our view is that if you're going to service the customer, you've got to be near the customer. That's one. I think the second and equally significant issue is that, generally speaking, our competitors fall into one of two categories. They are either financiers of aircraft, mostly banks who provide debt, or they are operating lessors, such as ILFC, which is, an, was, is still an AIG subsidiary, or CIT, or Royal Bank of Scotland, or whatever. We are the only party in this field that we know of that is large in both areas. We are both a financier, meaning an airline has purchased an aircraft and is looking for financing. We will provide either equity or debt, or we, and we buy speculatively from Boeing and Airbus and Bombardier and Embraer, and then we look for customers. We're the only ones who do that. We're the only ones who provide spare engine, uh, uh, engine leasing. We're the only one who do part trade out. So we have a much more comprehensive suite of products and services than we offer. And historically, um, because of that, we've been able to do better uh, during the various cycles, because it's a very cyclical industry, unfortunately. Well, challenges to keep me awake at night, uh, I'm going to put aside my teenage boys for the moment. <laughs> They're the ones who keep me awake mostly, um, uh, are that um, um, the length uh, of this cycle, one, um, 
uh, most cycles have come and gone in two or three years. This one could be longer. We simply don't know. We don't know because we don't know when we're going to hit bottom. I mean, that's the question that everyone from our president to the leaders around the world does not know. So, uh, and that could be a difference. Um, and the second thing that always keeps me awake, although not right now, is, is there going to be some sort of technological breakthrough in the next generation of aircraft, which will obsolete our existing fleet of over $40 billion of aircraft more quickly than was in our business plan? And that is something that worries me. Um, I think there are many things that concern me. Um, you know, I think that the governments, particularly the U.S. And, the, and Western Europe, must do something to improve air traffic control. And that would be an enormous benefit to the industry because the industry then could manage their aircraft more efficiently, avoid costly uh, fuel, and reduce emissions and make flying actually a more hospitable thing for, for the flying public. For more business news and analysis from Knowledge at Wharton, please visit knowledge.wharton.upenn.edu.